Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and present uh, my talk on the echocardiographic evaluation of pericardial diseases. And we're going to focus on uh, constrictive uh, pericarditis versus restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy in this particular talk. Uh, the normal pericardium is about one to two millimeter thick. Uh, it's got the uh, outer fibrous layer and the inner serous uh, layer. Uh, and uh, both the visceral and the parietal uh, pericardial layers uh, provide uh, uh, a support during the cardiac motion uh, by anchoring the cardiac structures. It provides lubrication. And to some degree, it has been um, uh, thought that it provides also uh, a protective uh, function uh, to the cardiac epicardial surface. Uh, but the most important aspect um, is uh, it uh, prevents uh, cardiac distension, particularly uh, during diastole. Um, uh, it uh, helps uh, abnormal excessive uh, dilatation of chambers. And this is something seen uh, immediately after pericardiectomy during the post-surgical phase. Uh, you may see um, increasing size of the chambers, uh, uh, which of course over a period of time adapts itself. But uh, to some extent, it also helps in limiting the cardiac distension uh, during the phase of cardiac filling. Now, constrictive pericarditis uh, develops uh, whenever uh, you lose these uh, functions of the pericardium, particularly uh, it uh, alters uh, the distension of the cardiac chamber. It has a constricting ele element. So during the phase of diastole, uh, the intrapericardial volume is reduced. Uh, so the diastolic uh, distension of the chambers is uh, compromised. Plus, in addition, uh, the lubrication function is gone. So uh, the uh, normal cardiac motion that occurs inside the pericardium is uh, eliminated. And this card altered cardiac uh, deformation also leads to uh, uh, development of uh, difficulties in providing a normal relaxation and, and filling of the, of the left ventricle. Uh, the pathology of the constrictive pericarditis has been studied extensively. Uh, the pericardial layers, when they thicken, uh, they can lead to different types of cardiac uh, geometries. And you, here is uh, an example of all the different types of geometries that may be encountered. Particularly, there's a predilection for the uh, thickened uh, part of the uh, pericardium to happen near the cardiac, uh, near the cardiac base, particularly in the AV grooves. Uh, and it can happen asymmetrically around the chamber. It can be present uh, more focal and localized over uh, the chamber like in uh, the right ventricle. And these lead to different types of uh, hemodynamic uh, presentations, may, which may be challenging to recognize during uh, clinical uh, imaging. Uh, but uh, independent of uh, uh, the mechanism, it impedes the uh, function of diastolic filling, causing elevated filling pressure inside the uh, cardiac chambers and systemic venous uh, uh, congestion. The thickening of the pericardium can be appreciated using echocardiography. In fact, uh, using transesophageal echocardiography, uh, as you can see here, this thickened pericardium here over the right ventricle, uh, and here is a CT scan, uh, the same uh, thickening of the pericardium. There has been a very good correlation between the transesophageal measured, echocardiographic measured uh, pericardial thickness and also um, uh, the uh, CT pericardial thickness. However, despite the consistency of the information with regards to pericardial thickening, it's extremely important to understand that thickening of the pericardium does not mean constriction. It could be present with uh, the hemodynamic features of constriction, then cause uh, constrictive pericarditis. But isolated thickening, uh, if you want to rely upon may not necessarily be consistent always with, uh, uh, with constrictive pericarditis, the clinical presence of constrictive pericarditis. In fact, this particular study from Mayo Clinic long back showed that uh, the pericardial thickness can be normal uh, in, in several patients, uh, in almost about 25% of patients uh, with constrictive pericarditis. It's the altered material properties of the pericardium. It's the altered ability to deform in the diastole uh, and the compliance of the cardiac chamber along with the pericardium. That what leads to the physiology of constrictive uh, pericarditis. So it's important that although thickness of the pericardium can be 
obtained using transesophageal uh, approaches, echocardiography approaches, the uh, thickening, mere thickening of the pericardium is not necessarily enough for diagnosing the clinical syndrome of constrictive uh, pericarditis. Uh, the knowledge about the pathophysiology and the hemodynamic uh, uh, changes that happen with constriction have actually allowed us to understand uh, how in constrictive pericarditis, given the pericardium is altering the deformation of the cardiac chambers, it leads to the systemic venous congestion. So here are the prominent X and Y descent that you see uh, in the jugular venous form. So this is the central venous pressure tracings. Um, and there is uh, also equalization of the A and the V waves. And you get this characteristic uh, uh, pattern that also sometimes can be obtained clinically. If you examine the JVP, you see this uh, rapid descents uh, and a very high uh, elevated uh, 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 jugular venous uh, pressures in patients who are presenting with systemic venous congestion. In fact, the venous pressures can be sometimes so high that you might have to make the patient stand up and then only the upper level of the uh, venous columns may be uh, appreciated. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you get this characteristic uh, uh, features on the central venous pressure. Uh, and when you do the uh, measurements uh, in the intra uh, cardiac pressure measurements, uh, you get uh, there are certain characteristic features that were in the past described, for example, equalization of the LV and the RV diastolic pressure typically the right ventricular systolic pressure and the PA uh, pressures are not very high in constrictive pericarditis, so less than 50 uh, millimeters mercury. And also the end diastolic uh, pressure of the RV is elevated so that if you have the ratio, which almost uh, uh, is increasing more than one third of the systolic pressure of the RV, the diastolic pressure, then it indicates an elevated filling pressure. So, However, these some of the older criteria of hemodynamic features of of constrictive pericarditis, however, were not shown to be uh, very reliable uh, when, for, uh, for the clinical diagnosis. So there was a search for other additional criteria. Uh, uh, Lev Hatley um, provided uh, an insight into some unique features of uh, constrictive pericarditis that has really uh, helped us understand uh, the, the hemodynamic uh, changes that happen in constriction. And two characteristic features that happen in patients with constrictive pericarditis include the dissociation of the intrathoracic and the intracardiac pressure. And number two, there is an exaggeration of the LV and the RV interaction uh, or interdependence. These features were first described using um, intracardiac pressure tracings. And here are uh, some of the uh, typical findings that you see. So you have here the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh, that is recorded and you have the LV pressure. Now look what is happening during the phase of inspiration. During the phase of the inspiration, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is the intrathoracic compartment is falling down. So you have, you, have a, you have a reduction or falling down of the intrathoracic pressure. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is falling down, but the intracardiac, and this is the LV pressure, in LV pressure is not falling down simultaneously. So you, you see therefore there is a gradient. So there is a, some kind of a walling mechanism. Uh, typically, these pressures go together and they will decrease down uh, during the phase of inspiration. But there is somehow the pericardium walls off so that the intracardiac pressure, the LV diastolic pressure somehow does not reduce to the same extent. Uh, and as a consequence, this, this gradient in inspiration uh, is, is, uh, uh, is you can see here, there, there's a difference that is, that is maintained. And the second, secondly, uh, during the expiration, expiration, you see this exaggerated uptake of the uh, uh, pressure. The pressure rises uh, up in the pulmonary capillary chamber. However, the, the intra uh, uh, LV pressure, uh, the change is minuscule or not as much in comparison to the large change in the pressure that's happening in the pulmonary uh, capillary wedge pressure. So this is uh, some, some form of a walling mechanism in which the intrathoracic compartment and the LV diastolic compartments do not 
have the same transmission of the pressure. So there's a gradient, exaggerated gradient that is happening during the inspiratory and the expiratory uh, phases that is not transmitted into the intracardiac uh, chambers, the intra-LV pressures. Uh, and, and the second phenomenon that happens is the phenomenon of what is called as interventricular interdependence. And that is seen here in form of the systolic pressure. Now look at the pressure of the right ventricle during the inspiration and the pressure of the LV during the inspiration. So the uh, so you can see here during the inspiration, the, the pressure jumps up in the RV side. So the RV systolic pressure is increasing and there is a reduction of the pressure on the LV side. And in, during the expiration, you can see the RV pressure is falling down and the LV pressure is increasing up. So you can see here that the LV and the RV pressures are reciprocate, uh, reciprocally changing during the respiratory cycle. In inspiration, the, the RV goes up and the LV comes down. And during the expiration, the RV goes down and the LV comes up. So this is a phenomenon which was recognized as inter exaggerated interventricular interdependence and allowed us to understand the unique physiology and hemodynamic changes that were happening in patients with constrictive uh, pericarditis. Now, the quest to understand using echocardiography actually for constrictive per pericarditis, uh, you can see here an evolution uh, over a period of time from M mode to speckle tracking, uh, the same way our our understanding of constrictive pericarditis using echocardiography has continuously evolved. Each time a new technology that has come in, it has offered a new observation that has allowed us to recognize some typical features of constrictive pericarditis in the clinical practice using that specific attribute of echocardiographic application. For the first time when pericardial disease was described, uh, Dr. Feigenbaum described the, uh, the pericardial effusion. Uh, and after that, the same applications have continued uh, for understanding the pathophysiology of uh, constrictive pericarditis. And one of the most important changes that were first described using M mode and 2D echo was the abnormality of the septal motion. Now, the ab abnormality of the septal motion that is seen in constrictive pericarditis are of two types. One is called as the septal shudder. So there is a movement you can see here, a sharp movement, a bouncing motion of the septum during each and every cardiac cycle. So you can, you can see here how this large motion, uh, high frequency motion that is happening during diastole. This is called as the septal shudder. Plus, in addition, what you see is that the septum is moving from the RV side to the LV side and vice versa. So there are two components of the septal abnormal septal motion, and that is a septal, septal shudder and the movement back and forth from the RV towards the LV. So, so this will be an inspiration. So this is the respiratory mirror. And you can see here during the inspiration, the RV volume is increasing. So the RV size is increasing here and the septum is moving towards the LV and the LV size is reducing. Whereas during, uh, during expiration, the LV size is increasing and the RV size falls down. So this will be the expiration. And the septum is moving towards the right ventricle, and the, this is the left ventricle. So you can see here the moving back and forth of the of the septum. But in addition to that, then this abnormal high frequency motion that is happening in the septum. So there are two components. Now these two components can also be recognized on on two D uh, echocardiogram. Uh, this is the septum you can see during the respiratory cycles. Is It's moving back and forth. You can see here it is moving back and forth. Plus, in addition, there is a very high frequency movement, intermittent movement or shudder-like movement uh, that is happening during each and every cardiac cycle, which is, of course, much better uh, recognized during M mode echo. So in the current era, we continue to use M mode echo for understanding this abnormal septal motion 
in constrictive pericarditis and it provides much better temporal resolution of this abnormal septal motion and can be very useful for the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. And what this means that there is um, uh, uh, the septal shudder that happens, the, the quick uh, movement that is happening is because of a large quick equalization of elevated filling pressure that is coming in from the RA and the LA towards the RV and the LV just puts a, like a large frequency motion, sudden movement to the septum. Plus in addition, the interventricular interdependence, the exaggerated interventricular interdependence that happens in the constrained environment of a fixed pericardial volume causes this back and forth shift of the septum. And this is a very, very important and classic sign to recognize in clinical practice for understanding uh, constrictive pericarditis. Of course, one has to differentiate the abnormalities of septal motion that can happen in other types of diseases, like you can have a left bundle branch block, or you can have immediately post pericardiectomy, you can have uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. There are other conditions, atrial septal defect, where you can have abnormal septal motion. You need to recognize the differences and merely calling out an abnormal septal motion is not important. There are very specific features that need to be recognized for calling a constrictive pericarditis. However, if uh, one looked into just the mode uh, features of uh, IVC bounce, and there was another feature, which was the LV posterior wall flattening that was described. The, the sensitivity and the specificity of uh, diagnosing for diagnosing constriction is not that great. You would, you would not see them in all the patients, or you would, may have difficulty in differentiating from other types of abnormal septal motion. So the quest for finding other variables for understanding constrictive pericarditis continued subsequently. With the advent of the Doppler, one was able to revisit the uh, hemodynamic features of constriction, and there were a plethora of uh, uh, articles that came in uh, about how different velocity features using Doppler could be used for diagnosing constrictive uh, pericarditis. So typically, if you would place a, a pulse wave Doppler over the mitral valve tips, or over the uh, tricuspid valve tips, it will allow you to record the signals. And what you see here is the features uh, of the varying flows during the cardiac cycle. As we, we came to know about how the uh, the walling of the uh, of the pericardium creates uh, a variance in the flow that uh, happens across the transmitral valve during inspiration and expiration, plus how the shifting chambers, uh, uh, a shifting sep interventricular septum and, and the, uh, causes differences in the volume of the chambers. Both of these features lead, are associated with uh, changes in the transmitral velocity. The transmitral velocity are exaggerated and bigger during expiration and reduced uh, during uh, inspiration, vice versa. The trans tricuspid velocity are exaggerated during inspiration and the, uh, the velocity is reduced uh, during expiration. And in addition, we see certain changes that are recognized uh, in the hepatic vein and also in the superior vena cava that can be recorded using pulse wave Doppler. And it's very important to uh, uh, recognize some of these features as well, particularly during the phase of uh, for inspiration when the flow is uh, uh, coming inwards uh, into the right ventricle, you will see a forward flowing velocity in the hepatic vein. And during the expiration, as the flow reduces on the right side, you start seeing an attenuation of the velocities in the hepatic vein. In, in, in place of those forward moving waves, you see actually reversal flow of the flow. And this reversal of the flow is more, very well characterized in the hepatic vein and can be very useful to diagnose constrictive pericarditis. And we will see some of those examples uh, in the next few slides. So here is an example of a transmitral filling pattern. You can see here, this is the inspiration and this is the expiration. If you look into the first beat, 
during the inspiration and the first beat during the expiration. If you look into the peak of the E wave and the peak of the E wave from inspiration to expiration, you see a large change of velocity from 0.6 to 0.9%. And this change is 34%. So you can see here a large change that happens from the full speed after inspiration to the full speed after expiration. And this change, if it's more than 25%, can be useful for diagnosing uh, the findings which are useful to confirm the presence of constrictive uh, uh, pericarditis. So more than 25% variation in the respiratory flow in the mitral E velocities that is in patients with uh, constrictive pericarditis. Conversely, on the right hand side, you can see here the trans speed flow velocity. So this is the inspiration and this is the expiration. This is the E wave after the beginning of the first inspiratory uh, cycle. So the E wave and the first E wave after the beginning of the expiratory cycle. So you take from here to the here, you see a large change from 0.6 to 0.3. So there is a 50% or more change in the trans spin inflow peak E velocity. And these flow velocities, typically if they are more than 40% in the tricuspid E velocity, that, that can allow us to diagnose the presence of, uh, of findings that are, uh, that, are, that are consistent with constrictive pericarditis. Same way, if you look into the hepatic venous signal, here is a respirometer. So this is the inspiration and this is the expiration. Now in the inspiration, you see this is the ECG waveform, this is the QRS, so this is the S wave, and this is the D wave, the diastolic wave. So both the waves here are forward looking or they're moving uh, uh, a, 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 in the hepatic veins towards the IVC. This, is, this has been taken from the hepatic veins, so the flow is moving towards the IVC. So this is a forward movement, movement in systole, this is a forward movement in diastole. Now let's come to expiration. So this is the expiratory cycle here. So this, let's look into the first beat up in the expiratory cycle. In the expiratory cycle, you see this is the S wave, the systolic wave, and there should be some wave here in diastole wave. Well, in place of that, you see a reversal and one more reversal. So this is the systolic flow in the anti-grade direction towards the IVC, followed by a systolic flow reversal. It rapidly moves up and gets moving in the opposite direction. This is an exaggerated flow reversal in systole, in the early part of systole. And also in diastole, instead of moving forward, you're seeing a backward wave. So this is a diastole backward wave, a reversal, a flow reversal wave. When you see this large remarkable flow reversals that happen with expiration in comparison to the flow velocity in, in inspiration, this is diagnostic or specific for the presence of constrictive physiology. So this is again a very important finding for patients with constrictive uh, uh, pericarditis. So inspiration, expiration, and then you can see the changes in the flow velocity, particularly the appearance of flow reversals in diastole that allow you to diagnose the physiology of constrictive pericarditis. Now this Reversal is happening because in, in during the expiratory phase, as you would remember, the right ventricle is not taking in any further flow. And in fact, the flow is reversing in the IBC and the IBC is usually engorged and very plethoric. And there could be bright uh, uh, rollo formations that are also seen. Uh, so a plethoric IBC with exaggerated flow reversals in the hepatic veins during expiration allows us to be Consistent, consistent with the physiology of constrictive pericarditis. And these changes all in respiratory cycles can also be appreciated in the SVC flow. You can see here the changes that have been recorded from the SVC in inspiration and expiration. And expiration. However, I would have to admit that the routine Doppler information from the SVC may be a little challenging and one relies a little bit more in the hepatic vein flow signal uh, velocities. Uh, typically in clinical practice, uh, transmitral, transtracuspid, 
and uh, the, the hepatic vein flow velocities would allow you to provide some consistency in uh, diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. The SVC flow can be useful, particularly in patient when the large velocity variations uh, can be observed, particularly in patients with constricted, uh, with chronic obstructive lung disease. And once we are trying to uh, decide whether this flow velocity uh, changes are because of uh, because of uh, COPD or constricted pericarditis. But uh, but SVC flow typically is not routinely obtained, or it is difficult to obtain in all patients with uh, cleanly and maybe technically challenging. You may also guess, uh, get features of pulses paradoxes. So if you have an LV outflow Doppler signals, in addition to the transmetral flow velocity and the transtricuspid flow velocity, you may also get the, uh, the reduction of the flow uh, and the LV outflow with inspiration and exaggerated uh, uh, flow during expiration. So the feature that would be consistent with diagnosis of pulses paradoxes can be seen in uh, several patients with chronic constrictive uh, pericarditis. Uh, when we look into the diagnostic yield of just looking into the transmitral and the transtracuspid and the hepatic vein uh, Doppler signal, again, in, if you look at them in isolation, you find that the sensitivities and specificities are not uh, perfect. And therefore there was continued quest for understanding more elements in echocardiography that can allow you to understand constrictive physiology. Uh, so you now start looking beyond Doppler. Uh, and, and particularly, uh, people were confronting a, a very interesting situation where they were seeing patients with constriction, but there was no respiratory or respirophasic variation that was encountered. So for example, this is a patient whom you can see on fluoroscopy, the, the pericardium is completely calcified completely calcified. This patient is also in atrial fibrillation. Now you can understand in a patient who's got an atrial fibrillation, there can be a lot of variation related to RR intervals itself. Uh, to top it, uh, if you look into the hemodynamics, you can see here, the RA pressures are very high. There is that wide descent that you can see. There's a square root sign that uh, the RV, LV pressures are equally created. And in this, situation, uh, you can see the RR intervals are changing, but there is very little difference in the pressure changes or the characteristic pressure changes during the respirophasic intervals are a little bit difficult to uh, see here in this particular patient. Uh, if you see the transmitral E velocity, despite the changes in the RR interval and the patient having respirophasic cycles, the E-wave is almost near the same. This is a patient who has got a very high filling pressure. The LA pressure and the RA pressure are so high, are very high, that it is uh, leading to inability to um, uh, diagnose uh, constrictive pericarditis. So even if you try to do respirophasic maneuvers, you'll not have a, a, a you'll not be able to bring forth the typical changes in the respirophasic velocities because of very high filling uh, pressures. So for these reasons, there was a need uh, to look into some other parameters beyond just transmitral and transtricuspid flow velocities. Mario Garcia and colleagues proposed uh, looking into tissue Doppler velocities, uh, particularly looking at the mitral annular velocities, which allows the longitudinal uh, descent of the mitral annular plane to be measured and the speed of the annular dis dis descent uh, to be measured during diastolic phases. They showed an interesting behavior. They showed that in patients with constrictive pericarditis, the mitral annular descent during early diastole, the speed of the descent was preserved, in fact, a little slightly exaggerated than the normal uh, individuals, whereas it will be highly attenuated in a patient who would have uh, basically restrictive cardiomyopathy or myopathic process uh, inside the ventricle. So this change or difference in the E prime velocity became a very important feature uh, that has been uh, now uh, looked upon and 
uh, as a consistent feature for diagnosing constrictive uh, pericarditis. And there were some additional features that happen uh, that, uh, that are unique in patients with constrictive pericarditis. Uh, you see a phenomenon called as annular paradoxus. Uh, if you look into E by E prime, and elevated E by E prime usually goes hand in hand uh, with an elevated filling pressure. So it, there will be, uh, if a patient's filling pressures are high, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures are high, usually E by E prime is elevated. However, in patients with constrictive pericarditis, what we find here is a dynamic mitral annulus makes a big attempt to move the annulus longitudinally, longitudinally back and forth. And despite the presence of a restrictive filling pattern, you can see a very tall E wave um, here and the A wave is very uh, small. So E by A ratio is more than two, despite a restrictive filling pattern, which indicates elevated uh, left atrial pressure, a pulmonary capillary wet pressure. Because of the exaggerated annular motion, the E by E prime ratio is, remains normal or low normal. So this is called as an annulus paradoxus in, com in, in comparison to other the situation in, in which heart failure because of myocardial diseases or restrictive cardiomyopathy would cause the E by E prime ratio to go up. And another feature that can be seen in patients with, uh, with constrictive pericarditis is called as annulus reversus. Usually the lateral uh, wall velocities are higher than the septal wall uh, velocities, but in constriction, because the free wall gets adhered to the pericardium, it moves less. So the lateral velocities go down versus the septal velocities, they go up. So there is a reversal of the velocity speak, peaks of the early diastolic uh, uh, filling, that's the E prime velocity, is attenuated in the lateral wall and exaggerated in the septal wall, which is converse a reverse of what happens in normal individual the lateral annular velocities are higher than the uh, septal annular uh, velocity in early diastole. So this feature was also seen by uh, and described and is known as annulus reversus. However, if you just look into uh, early diastolic velocities alone, there can be some challenges. For example, if you have a heavy calcification around the mitral valve annulus, or if you have a patient with a, a metallic prosthetic valve uh, or a met a prosthetic material in the annular plane, uh, uh, you may not be able to get a, a very well-defined mitral annular velocities. And therefore, for those reasons, uh, there was a change towards looking at multiple parameters. So looking into multiple, starting from M mode to the Doppler annular velocities, uh, to look at multiple parameters and finding some consistency of information for diagnosing uh, constrictive pericarditis. There has also been an attempt to look beyond mitral annular velocities to try to understand how newer uh, techniques can be used. And here is a description of uh, annular velocities, how it functions. Now you can see here uh, that the annular velocities are really, really very reliable in, in a great way. If you see a very well-preserved E prime velocity in a patient who has come with right heart failure or is, uh, is you're suspecting constrictive pericarditis, uh, then you know uh, that this patient likely has uh, 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 has has some constrictive uh, physiology going around. So if you see a normal or high normal E prime velocity in a patient with heart failure, think pause and think about constriction. Speckle tracking echocardiography is another technique that has been recently applied, although. Some of the applications have not been uh, and observations have not been uh, recorded into the guideline statement, but can be uh, principally used to understand the same physiologies. So here is an example of a patient who is on the table. And in fact, this is a patient who was brought in for a pericardial tap. Uh, and I was called in and this patient is lying on the cath table. And this is the image that you see. 
Uh, well, the first thing that you see here is that this is not a pericardial effusion. This is a patient who's got a very large pleural effusion. In fact, the pericardial layers are very densely adhered. What you see here is the abnormal septal shudder. You can see here the abnormal septal motion. And then in addition, you look into the physiology of using trans uh, uh, Doppler techniques, you will see here that there is an element of respiratory uh, flow. Now the patient is extremely tachycardic and therefore it is difficult sometimes to get the nice uh, signals and particularly it is challenging on a patient who's lying supine on a table, but you can get a, some impression that there is probably transmitral flow velocities are changing uh, during the respirophasic phases. The IVC is extremely dilated but the most important and impressive is look at the mitral annular velocity. The mitral annular velocity is extremely high. It is 16.5 centimeters per second. In a patient who has got an elevated filling pressure, who is in heart failure, this exaggerated mitral annular velocity, look at the right ventricular systolic pressure is measured as 45 millimeters mercury. This is extremely concerning for diagnosing a constrictive physiology. This is a patient who's on the table who's got constrictive pericarditis. In fact, we aborted the whole procedure and diagnosis just changed because all of these features, one after the other, starting from the septal bounds, transmitral flow velocities, dilated IVCs, and you see here uh, also, a uh, mitral annular velocity, which is extremely high in a patient with heart failure, normal uh, uh, LV function. This is all features consistent with constrictive pericarditis. So we went ahead and did an additional step to look into how this LV is moving. Now you can see here, this is a speckle tracking echocardiography from the lateral side to the, uh, to the septal size, uh, side. And you know, this is all uh, information. Interestingly, this LV is attempting to squeeze in a longitudinal direction. So longitudinally, it is trying to contract and expel the and create a stroke volume in a constrained environment. Uh, so the longitudinal deformation uh, is is still relatively preserved. This is minus 17. So you can see here it's well at very close to minus 20. So the longitudinal strain of this ventricle, despite challenged environment of a heart failure, is 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 very uh, near normal. Uh, this again is a feature that suggests that the myocardium is able to contract longitudinally uh, and is able to uh, is able to try to maintain a stroke volume uh, and and again goes consistent with the features that this is not a myocardial disease. This is a normal myocardium which is moving normally in the longitudinal direction and it helps us to eliminate uh, myocardial disease as a cause of heart failure versus another patient looks very similar. And this is, of course, the patient's CT scan showing the pericardial thickening. Uh, you can see the full red carpet, which indicates a normal strain. The global strain is, uh, is preserved. This patient, this is a CT scan. You can see the large pleural effusions uh, and, and also the, uh, the peri there's a thickening of the pericardium that is uh, uh, allowing you to understand, uh, understand that this is a pericardial, constrictive pericardial uh, uh, disease, pericardial constriction as underlying physiology, and you have clutched the diagnosis. This is another patient who looks similar, very mimic, uh, similar looking patient. You got an effusion on the top, uh, and this is again uh, being brought in for a tapping. Again, the LV function is relatively uh, preserved, but it looks the LV is, is slightly thickened. But what you see here again is the mistake that this is not a pericardial effusion. This is a pleural effusion. And what you see here is the pericardial layers, the, the visceral and the uh, the parietal layers are sliding nicely over each other. So they are not adhered uh, with one another. The sliding well, the underlying myocardium is sliding well. So this patient has something else going around. Now let's look into the, the Doppler pattern. Again, you see uh, a, a restrictive filling pattern 
But most importantly, that you see here, the mitral annular velocity is markedly attenuated. The E prime, uh, the mitral is four centimeters per second. This is compared that other patient that was 16 centimeters per second. This LV is having difficulty in relaxing in the longitudinal direction and the velocity is only four centimeters per second. And of course, the patient has got uh, elevated pulmonary arterial pressure. You can see here RVSP, which is uh, the, the TR signal is over three centimeters per second. So this patient has a uh, preserved ejection fraction. E by E prime is elevated. So you have uh, uh, eight over four, nearly 20. Uh, e by E prime and uh, uh, has got a markedly attenuated uh, E prime velocity. Uh, and if you do a strain uh, in this particular patient, uh, you're, you're looking into the deformation uh, in four chamber. And what you see here is a very markedly attenuated performance. You can see here, the, if you look at the overall picture, there is a cherry on the top. Uh, and and the, the numbers are really, really pale. So this is a markedly attenuated longitudinal function. So this is a patient who has got, if you would apply uh, the strain features that will indicate some form of infiltered uh, myocardium, like for example, cardiac amyloidosis. And this patient has a elevated uh, uh, right atrial uh, pressures, left atrial pressures, pleural effusion. The patient is in heart failure. This is very, very consistent with the restrictive cardiomyopathy, for example, with an infilter disease, life constrictive pericarditis. So you have uh, used a strain here in this particular example for uncovering presence of a myocardial disease. The myocardial disease, the dysfunction is very well identified and incrementally adding the information allows you to diagnose a patient with restrictive uh, cardiomy cardiomyopathy in comparison to the other patient with constrictive pericarditis. So there is a uh, disparity in the pattern of how not only the vent contract, but also the physiology of the cardiac function, which can be uncovered using Doppler mechanics. So serially adding up 2D um, um, M more Doppler strain patterns can allow you to differentiate from a myocardial disease versus a pericardial disease and differentiating constricting uh, constrictive pericarditis, pericarditis from restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy. There is also a role for imaging beyond echocardiography, which is important to understand. There is complementary information that can come from CT and MRI techniques, particularly. Constrictive pericarditis, the physiology once diagnosed, uh, it needs to be associated with the clinical story. If the clinical story suggests that there is an ongoing inflammatory process, even if a patient has a constrictive physiology and as it is in a heart failure, you should look out for reversible features uh, like a reversible inflammatory state. And that can be recognized using uh, inflammatory biomarkers and looking into reversibility uh, of the inflammatory uh, phenomenon uh, using ga delayed gadolinium enhancement. In fact, if you see uh, the delayed gadolinium enhancement disappears after anti-inflammatory therapy and the features of constriction disappear, you have in fact diagnosed a reversible process and therefore these patients would not be required to be subjected for surgery. It's very important to understand the features of constrictive physiology are reversible in a patient who presents with an inflammatory state and who can respond to anti-inflammatory therapies and therefore constrictive physiology, once diagnosed, needs to be seen with a lens of whether there is an inflammatory state and that could be diagnosed using delayed gadolinium enhancement. Also, MRI techniques have developed uh, that allow you to get consistent information that is obtained from echo. For example, the abnormal septal motion and the inter-exaggerated interventricular interdependence can be diagnosed using also uh, MRI uh, uh, techniques that you can see here in this particular patient who's got constrictive pericarditis that there is uh, 
uh, market abnormal septal shift that is seen. Uh, uh, in addition, what you also see, this is a CT scan of the same patient. The patient has a very thickened pericardial uh, uh, layer over the right ventricle and there is evidence of some inflammatory state. This is a delayed gadolinium enhancement. All of this information is very important. This patient was found to have uh, an inflammatory uh, a state, and therefore an initial attempt was made for seeing that if the patient would respond to anti-inflammatory medications. This patient, of course, after a period of time, continued to stay in features of constrictive uh, physiology with elevated fillic pressure. Finally, of course, was brought back after several months and pericardectomy was done. Uh, you can see here the features of uh, elevated filling pressure ascites, engorged IBC is seen here. This patient ultimately was subjected for surgery and you can see the thick rind of uh, 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 pericardium that was exposed and removed from over the right ventricle. Uh, so this is a, a multimodality imaging in very challenging situation that allows us to do incrementally uh, the decision towards the final therapy. Uh, but in many patients, the inflammatory state may subside and the features of constriction may be uh, reversible. Uh, there has been also an attempt towards looking into the mechanics of the ventricles uh, using uh, feature tracking, uh, which can be done, particularly feature tracking and delayed gadolinium enhancements uh, are very useful for differentiating restrictive cardiomyopathy from constrictive pericarditis. You can see here is a normal individual. You can see here the mitral annular motion is normal, it just looks like the normal, and the longitudinal function is normal. And this is a patient with restrictive cardiomyopathy. The annular function is attenuated, and the strain in the longitudinal direction is, uh, is attenuated. So this is a patient of restrictive cardiomyopathy versus a constrictive uh, pericarditis. Uh, the myocardial involvement can happen in patients with constriction and is important to diagnose because if there is increasing infiltration uh, with myocardial disease uh, uh, processes, even in patients with constriction, uh, they may be a differential uh, outcome after pericardiectomy. Uh, and you, you can see here that patients who have uh, ev evidence of myocardial dysfunction even in presence of constrictive pericarditis, uh, this can be extremely challenging, particularly presence of secondary causes of constriction, uh, like cardiac uh, surgery or previous cabbage, uh, may create mixed picture or mixed diseases. So radiation is another example. And these uh, situation, you, you have to use multiple tools, multimodality strain to understand what is the extent of myocardial disease in a patient who looks like having constrictive pericarditis. And one has to be careful in understanding the reversibility of the disease after pericardiectomy. And some of these patients may not have uh, good survival uh, particularly with the mixed disease if pericardiectomy is done. So that could be a challenge and therefore multiple modalities can be extremely helpful. This is the algorithm that has been given uh, by the guidelines, the 2016 ASC uh, uh, Diastolic Dysfunction Guideline document provides this algorithm to look into multiple features. They provide uh, an initial assessment to look into uh, the transmitral flow velocities, particularly in presence of dilated inferior vena cava. So if you have a restrictive filling pattern with dilated inferior vena cava, yes, that goes towards constriction. Then look if there is an abnormal subtle motion uh, that is present, uh, particularly with respiraphasic motion that are present, yes that would be again towards constriction. Then you look into the mitral uh, uh, velocities if they are uh, you know, uh, completely normal. So this ventricle is behaving like a normal ventricle in the longitudinal direction. You have clenched the diagnosis of constriction. If you have uh, a, a reduced velocity, then that will be going towards restrictive cardiomyopathy. If you have if you're in between, it could be a mixed disease. You may need more information using strain, using multimodalities. Uh, you also may try to look towards uh, other features. For example, if you have hepatic vein expiratory flow reversals, uh, then that's really uh, helpful to diagnose a constriction. If you have annulus reversals, 
then it's uh, again helpful for diagnosis uh, constriction. Uh, so uh, the diagnosis of constriction and restriction continues to be extremely, extremely uh, uh, challenging and requires multiple variables uh, that need to be added together towards the diagnosis. However, if you look into some of these features, uh, feel the presence of restrictive filling pattern, um, uh, um, so elevated filling pressure. So this is not necessarily a restrictive filling pattern. This diagnostic presence of elevated uh, uh, either pseudonormal or restrictive uh, uh, filling pattern, uh, dilated vena cava, abnormal septal motion, and then you're, you've got uh, mitral, uh, abnormal mitral uh, E velocities, then it's restrictive cardiomyopathy. If it is a normal, that goes towards constriction. Uh, and, and that helps us uh, further to be substantiated with the presence of hepatic vein expiratory flow reversal that really helps us take clinch the diagnosis of constrictive uh, pericarditis. There are new technologies using machine learning, learning algorithms in some of this decision pathways can be integrated. And perhaps in the future, some of these uh, techniques can be uh, used using machine learning approaches to develop a decision pathway that could be more ready and usually uh, and utilized in clinical practice uh, for integration of the information that is often challenging uh, uh, to integrate. Um, to summarize there for, uh, for constricted pericarditis, look for septal shutter, look for the transmitral flow velocities, trans tricuspid flow velocities, hepatic vein reversals, presence of uh, uh, normal or an abnormal E prime, presence of uh, uh, increased uh, uh, filling pressures as diagnosed by E by E prime or uh, uh, a normal E by E prime, which goes in favor of constrictive pericarditis and then use of additional modalities like longitudinal strain and other modalities like CT and CMR, which can provide incremental information. Remember that thickened pericardium is not necessarily constriction. You need to have hemodynamic features of constriction and also the thickness can be normal in up to 25% of patients with constricted uh, uh, pericarditis. And that constrictive physiology needs to be seen in the lens of an inflammatory state because constrictive physiology is reversible. And in, in such situation, using MRI for looking into pericardial inflammation can be extremely helpful. Thank you very much.